going to do today, I put it over here. We're going to look at this, this issue of happiness again. It's been a week since we met. I think it could be good to do a little bit of going back over section two of utilitarianism um, and going a little bit more into detail about some of the themes that he brought up. So this will both re you know, be a refresher and we're going to go deeper into it. Um, then we're going to talk about how Mill treats duty, virtue, wealth, these things that we saw in other moral theories. You remember virtue ethics, virtue is key, um, wealth is just a, a means to an end, pleasure is just something that comes from virtuous activity. If you make it into an end, you get some problems. Duty actually comes from virtue. Um, deontology is going to make duty the central prime motivator, and Mill is actually in part responding to Kant in, when he's writing about that. One of the things that you notice is that moral theories actually address each other. So there was a reason why Plato brought up a couple different positions before he went into his own. There was a reason why Aristotle discussed a bunch of different ideas of happiness. There's a reason why Hobbes was trying to sweep everybody else away. It's because there's other moral theories out there, and if you want your own to get a good hearing, you have to show why it's the best. You can't just go out and say, here's my idea. Other people had ideas before you, so you actually have to address their ideas. And so that's what Mill is going to do. Then we're going to talk about how we would apply this to three sort of big issues. You know, oftentimes in ethics classes, they spend a lot of time focusing on what they call applied issues. So we're actually going to do a bit of that today. And we're going to look at food and hunger, which utilitarians have, have written quite a bit about. Punishment, the utilitarian conception of punishment actually radically changed our legal system um, and our criminal justice system. And then finally, uh, the thorny issue of abortion. So let's look first at um, this idea of happiness again. This is a quote from the fourth part of, of utilitarianism, um, but it applies really well to the second. And Mill is asking, can you actually prove that this is the best moral theory? Can you prove that, that there's um, a reason why we want to favor the general happiness? He says, well, in a way, no. Because it's so basic, he thinks, that it's not susceptible of uh, the kind of proof that we would, we would like to have in some cases. He says, no reason can be given why the general happiness is desirable except, except the fact that each person desires his own happiness as far as he thinks it's attainable. And then he goes on and he says, but this is a fact. Each person does desire their own happiness. He says, we can take this as a given about human nature. And if you think about yourself, who here doesn't want to be happy? Anybody? Anybody want to be miserable? You do? I mean, sometimes people will say, yeah, I do, because, you know, I, I enjoy being miserable. Well, then that's your conception of happiness, apparently, right? A, a masochist um, is made <coughs> happy by feeling pain. Um, there, there's an old joke, actually. You, know, you guys are familiar with the concepts of masochist and sadist, right? The sadist likes inflicting pain. And the masochist <laughs> is the person who says, hurt me, hurt me. And the sadist is the person who says, no. Because, you know, that screws up somebody else's happiness. Um, people who put their conception of happiness, say, in doing their duty. And they say, I don't care if I'm happy. I just want to do what I'm supposed to do. I want to follow the rules. I want to do um, what you know I'm obliged to. Well, that's what makes them happy, right? That, that's one way to respond to that. Um, we're going to look at the, that a little bit more closely. Each person does, in fact, desire their own happiness. Here, Mill is actually agreeing with Aristotle, with Plato, with Hobbes, with all the other people that we've, we've looked at this semester. Thomas Aquinas, right? Um, so can you get from the fact that each of us desires our own happiness to why the general happiness is desirable? That's kind of a leap, isn't it? Do you necessarily care what other people feel, experience, what their outcomes are, if you are seeking your own happiness? What if you are a sadist? What would your happiness be like? 
making someone else miserable? Yeah. I mean, that would be a very outlier case, right? You know, that wouldn't be the exception. I mean, that would, that would be the exception. That wouldn't be the, the rule. But they don't seem to be concerned with the general happiness. Um, who else could you think of as doesn't seem to be particularly concerned with the general happiness? Egoists. What's that? Egoists. Egoists. Egoists, yeah. Anybody who, oh good. Uh, anybody who, who has um, an egoist moral perspective says, I want to get what I want and screw everybody else. If, they have, if their interests happen to coincide with my own, or to further my own, well, that's great, and I'm happy to help them out then, but if they get in my way, look out. Um, so an egoist doesn't seem to be very concerned with the general happiness. Um, and I suppose that would cover pretty much, we, we could use that to cover all the sort of individual cases we might come across. Um, there's actually, there we go, a um, interesting problem that comes up Whenever you have a group situation, it's called free rider problem. Um, uh, maybe some of you have experienced this when you do group exercises or if you get group grades. One of the reasons why the, the better students usually don't like to do group work is because what happens when you do group work? You get group assignments. Um, the majority seem to do do a lot of work and there's always one person that just doesn't really do anything. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's always one person that just follows along but doesn't really do their part. Yeah. And you know, it's it's kind of tough, especially we, we give you guys a lot of group work as students. Um, and I think sometimes we don't give you enough advice on how to be tough on each other and, and you know say, hey you gotta do your fair share. Um, that's an egoist that's, a, that's an example of an egoist perspective, right? The person who says, well, you know, all these other people are doing the work. I can get the credit. I don't really have to do much here. I'll just pretend like I don't know what I'm talking about. One of the ways to actually get out of work, as you're going to find as you get older, is just be bad at it. Other people won't ask you to do it. If you don't want to do the dishes anymore, start breaking dishes. And then people won't ask you to do it, right? But that would not be looking out for the general happiness. Um, Mill says that this is a fact, uh, that everybody does desire their own happiness. So we not only have all the proof there could be for such a proposition, and all the proof that could possibly de be demanded that happiness is a good, that each person's happiness is a good to that person, okay? Therefore, that general <laughs> happiness is a good to the aggregate of all persons. What is the general happiness? It's when we put everybody's happiness all together. Um, and Mill seems to be saying something like, well, if we were thinking things through clearly, then we would see that we're happier when other people are happier. Um, and again, you know, could, could a sadist say, I'm perfectly happy uh, when other people are miserable? Um, the, uh, and Mill actually knew of the guy that we have named sadism after the Marquis de Sade, who wrote a lot of books in which people are, the whole point of them is, is not to make people reading them miserable, but the whole point of the books themselves are all these different ways in which people can be tortured, raped, abused, um, mentally, you know, put in mental anguish over, over these sort of things, and the fact that the other characters are deriving pleasure from this. Um, that's where we get the word sadism. Maybe that can't be satisfactorily responded to. But Mill can probably talk to most people. And so that's what we're going <clears> to <throat> look at. We have to think also, what is, okay, so the general happiness, my jaw, is, is the aggregate of individual happiness, right? What is individual happiness? If you had to give one word for a utilitarian, what is it? Think just back to Bentham. Mankind has two masters. Yeah. Pleasure. Pleasure. Very good. Um, and that seems really simple and straightforward, right? But like we looked at last <coughs> class, there's different kinds of pleasures, aren't there? Some pleasures are not only quantitatively better, like, you know, if you give me three Let's see, I, my, my favorite candy bar that I, I routinely 
would get, I mean, there are some really, really good candy bars, but I don't usually get those, would be a whatchamacallit. And one whatchamacallit, is that as good as three whatchamacallits? Pick whatever candy bar you like, or treat, or dessert. No, three is better than one, right? But that's quantitatively better. Um, what would go beyond that? Well, reading mill, reading, learning something in the process. That's better than a whatchamacallit, and it's not better because it's worth three whatchamacallits or ten whatchamacallits. It's qualitatively better. It's at a higher level. Um, <coughs> greater pleasure qualitatively, richer, more refined pleasure than that. Um, eating a really fine meal. I mean, let's think in terms of fast food. What are your favorite fast food places that you go to? Because I know all of us do eat fast food every once in a while. What are your guilty pleasures? Is it McDonald's? Is it Burger King? Is it Taco Bell? Is it, what is, what's your? I like Burger King. I, I prefer Burger King to McDonald's myself. But um, I noticed too, when I stopped eating Burger King quite so much, and I started cooking for myself, I didn't like it quite so, so much as I used to. Um, once you start eating good food, things that are qualitatively better, <coughs> the, the other pleasures start to pale in comparison, don't they? I could probably live without Burger King um, the rest of my life. Um, it wouldn't be any great loss, in part because I'm, I'm eating better food. Food that I cook, or my fiance cooks, or you know, go to a nice restaurant, or go to somebody's house where they're having a dinner party and they have some good food. That's a different thing. Uh, same thing can go for music, right? How many of you have had your musical taste change since high school? None of you? Only, only one of you? Well, I mean, you're, you're older than the other students. Maybe, maybe this is going to take a while, but your musical taste actually will change. Um, and you may, you know, come back to the stuff that you really liked in high school. Um, I actually did after about 30, no, about 20 years. Um, but I was listening to it on a different level at that point. Um, why would your taste change? What do you think happens to you? Well, like, the music changes, and then, I don't know, for me, everything got repetitive. So then you, I, okay. you, know, you have to kind of look for something different. And... Yeah, that's, that's a good feature that's a good <coughs> to pick out. When you're talking about lower order pleasures, after a while, they do get repetitive. Um, think about... Um, going out. You know, the first first couple times you go out and you're young, it's really fun and, you know, everything's a big adventure, but you can get sick of that, can't you? Or the first time you hear whatever kind of music it is that you really like, um, the first time that you heard it, and then the second time that you heard it, it was, it might have been like a, you know, a revelation to you. Wow! This is, this is out there, the world has this sort of pleasure in it. Um, but then after about you know 10 years of listening to that stuff, it tends to become kind of repetitive. Uh, same thing can be said for TV shows, um, food. I mean, you know, actually Burger King and McDonald's, they, they go out of their way to try to make one burger taste almost the same as another. That's the quality control, so it should be a competitive. If it doesn't, uh, either you know you've got miraculous taste buds, or you're getting really bad burgers. Um, let's think again about pleasures and what a happy life is is like. Um, Mill says, according to the greatest happiness principles, as I've explained it, the ultimate end for the sake of which all other things are desirable, what we're, what we're shooting for, what we're trying to govern our life by, is an existence as free as possible from pain. That sounds pretty good, right? You don't want to have pain in, in your life. You've all experienced some pain, some physical, some psychological. Some of you have experienced more pain than others. There are qualitatively worse pains, and we talked about those. Um, and as rich as possible in enjoyments. So what is this richness like, he says? This means rich in quantity and quality. 
So a life that is only rich in pleasures that have a lot of quantity, there's a lot of different pleasures, a lot of instances, but don't have quality is not a very enjoyable life. This is the kind of life that quite a few people actually still live today. <coughs> you know, um, the lower pleasures are not truly satisfying for a human being. The only way in which they become truly satisfying for a human being is when that human being's faculties become dull. When they become used to only <coughs> enjoying those lower pleasures. Think about reading. Um, some people enjoy reading, other people don't. The best predictor, actually, for figuring out whether a child is going to enjoy reading, do they see their parents actually reading for enjoyment? Um, if they do, they, they understand, hey, there's something to this. If they actually talk with the children about what do you actually uh, learn from this book, what do you find enjoyable about it, that, that even uh, makes it more likely that the child will um, and all of us get introduced to a lot of reading uh, if, if we don't go to bad uh, public school systems um, in school, right? You have to do a lot of reading and read summer books sometimes. Um, and hopefully you found something that you liked. And if you did, you probably had to work at it at first, right? There's a lot of great books that are not easy to read right off the bat but they will yield you pleasure if you work at them. Just like exercise, you know. If you, if you decide, I want to, you know, play football, I want to play soccer, if Ms. Garnett was here, I want to play basketball, you don't just start out great at it, do you? How many, how many, how many hours do you think you guys have put in doing drills? What'd you say? Including high school. It's got to be in the thousands, right? Is it maybe in the tens of thousands, do you think? What was, what was the whole point of that? Now you actually have a sort of facility with your body that lets you enjoy what you're doing. I hope, I hope all of you who are, are student athletes actually still enjoy the game, right? That you're doing. It's not just work. Um, that would be kind of awful, wouldn't it? Um, well, reading is like that too. And reading is a, a, a high refined pleasure. Mill tends to dissociate the body and the mind. I'm not sure that there couldn't be physical pleasures that wouldn't also be higher pleasures that you would, but you would have to train yourself to be able to enjoy them. You have to uh, put yourself at a certain level in order to, to enjoy them. So he says, rich in quantity and quality, the test of quality. How do you test what, you know, what pleasures are in fact higher in quality? Preferences of those who are best equipped to make the comparison. You need some sort of ideal judge. So if you start out and you pick up a great work of literature, say Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, and you start reading it back in you know grade school, you say, this is really boring. I don't want to learn about these Russian peasants and what they're doing and people being drunk and killing each other. And that's that's dull. You know, I'd rather read the, the sports page, or the comics, or, or whatever, because I'm familiar with that, you wouldn't be an ideal judge. You wouldn't be yet at the, the point where you could say, you know, I have actually experienced that, and I know it's not for me. Um, Mill tends to think that if you do fully experience it, you will find, the, you know, say the brothers Karamazov to be up here, and say Daniel Steele to be down here. Um, but it, it, here's a possibility. You could actually thoroughly plumb the depths of that pleasure and then say, ah, it, just not for me. Just like, for instance, um, if you ask me about different musical genres, um, some of them I can tell you a lot about, and I can say why I like this particular song or this particular piece and what's going on. And I'm, I'm sort of a, a refined critic when it comes to those others. I really don't know at all, and I, I'm not a good judge about at all. Some of them I've actually just found out about recently, and I was like, what kind of music is that? Uh, and then others I don't like, and I, I know why I don't like them, and I've given them a chance, um, and I still just don't like them. 
And I think you guys can probably relate to that. There are some qualitatively higher pleasures that you've tried out, and they just weren't for you, right? That doesn't mean that the next person down the, down the road can't appreciate them. That doesn't mean that you can't say, yeah, you know, if one could appreciate this, this would be a higher pleasure. Uh, it just means it's not really for you. Um, now, what does he say is needed for this? So those best equipped to make the comparison. Equipped by, he says, two things. The range of their experience and their habits of self-consciousness and self-observation. So I'm actually going to put this on, on the page. So to determine where qualitatively pleasures you need experience. And you also need habits. Um, Self-consciousness. And self-observation. Okay. So let's say you wanted to acquire these things. Odds are you actually have to some, some extent, okay? Because you guys are on average somewhere be, between 20 and 22 years old. So you, you've actually got quite a bit of experience. Do you have more experience ahead of you? What do, can you think of anything that you guys haven't yet experienced that you think you would like to try out to see if it's as good as people say it is? I hope so, because those are what you're striving for, right? What do, you, what do you want out of life to get to try out, as it were, from the inside, rather than just from the outside looking in? Yeah. You would say like a lot of traveling, like if you want to go to a place. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. You guys have all heard, oh, travel's so great. How many of you have traveled a lot, say, outside of the United States? Oh, actually, quite a few of you. Okay, so those of you who have, you have the requisite experience to judge, you know, what would be a good place to go to. Should you go to, say, just go to Disney World over and over and over again? Some people would be into that. Right? But maybe you'd want to go to, I don't know, Paris and actually see the, the Louvre. And, and, you know, if you find out that's not for you, after you try it out, then that would be uh, good to know. But you won't know until you actually try it out later. And I suppose you could just get a book and, and look through it. Oh, those, those are the paintings. Is that the same thing as, as going to the museum? Not really. Um, when, I, when I was in Paris, I didn't go to Louvre because they, they just had a bombing and there was a gigantic line outside. And so I just sort of wandered around the, the town and I found my way into a place called La Rangerie. And you've all seen Claude Monet's Water Lilies. You're all familiar with that. You can get prints at, at you know, Target or stuff like that. It's all that you know, impressionist stuff. And it's very colorful and all that. And you can get you know, a nice print about this big by this big. Um, well, what I didn't realize is that L'Orangerie is actually these, these four gigantic circles where the walls are about you know, 12 feet high. And the circles are about five times the size of this room. And Claude Monet's water lilies are actually painted, there's four of them, four paintings, the entire length of the room. Um, you wouldn't guess that from looking at the prints because the prints only give you like one tiny portion of it. I guess they're sort of like the best hits, you know. <laughs> um, the experience of actually being in there and taking in that artwork that way, that's something different that is hard to convey through through words, I think. I mean, maybe we maybe with computer generated stuff now we can we can do that for you. Um, but there's a lot of things that you need to experience. Travel. Um, anything else that you kind of looking forward to that you've heard is great, or at least could be great. You haven't experienced that, yeah. Like eventually, it's getting very. Yeah. Um, are any of you married right now? No? 
Okay, so um, that that can be a great thing. And it can also be a source of a lot of misery, as you find out in some sitcoms and, and, and novels and stuff like that. But it can also be a great source of, of pleasures. And there, we talked about this before, there are qualitatively higher pleasures that can come with that. Um, one reason to get married is to have sex, right? I mean, if, if you, if you're not having sex with the person that you marry, there's something that got mistaken somewhere along the line, right? Because that, that's one of the main purposes of, of marriage. And um, you could have sex, you don't have to actually be married to have sex, we all know this. You can go out and find somebody at a bar or uh, you know, do an ad online or something like that. But, and that brings pleasure, right? But that's perhaps a lower type of pleasure than the pleasure that comes with the intimacy sharing a life with somebody for years and years. That's one reason why people stay married. I mean, if it was only about sexual pleasure at you know the sort of basic level, I don't think very many people would stay married for more than two or three years. Because human beings tend to get a little bit, you know, tired of each other that way. <laughs> but there is a higher pleasure that comes with that, a mill would say, of, of intimacy. And some of you may have experienced that. Maybe you've been in a long-term relationship. I don't know, but I think that's probably you know ahead for most of you. And it would be difficult for you to say whether that really is a higher pleasure until you've experienced it. So what you have to do is rely on the people who you trust, who have experienced that. Experience by itself isn't enough, though. It also requires these habits of self-consciousness and self-observation. You actually have to like sit back every once in a while and think about these things. Um, and you don't have to necessarily do it on your own. This is something that men and women often tend to do, often apart from each other, um, in their discussions. We, we don't often think of, uh, you know, we, we often think of women going off and discussing all sorts of things. Men do that too. Um, they often do it in, in, in much more, you know, comedic ways. But part of what they're doing is they're comparing things. Mill would say that's, that's part of the good life, being able to think your way through these things. And so um, he also tells us a few other things about happiness. He says, if you want to have a satisfied life, there's two main constituents, and then he says there's two main requirements of happiness. The two main constituents are tranquility and excitement. And tranquility means having some time of actual rest. And you guys you know, just went on Thanksgiving, I'm imagining that uh, you didn't spend most of your time just um, doing work, I hope. You took a break, you relaxed. Maybe being with your family is not always relaxing, but you know, maybe that's part of the excitement part. <coughs> um, but you do need to have some relaxation in order to be happy. You also do need some excitement, some things that, that give you a, a charge. Um, so what stands in the way of this? Mill says there's two main things that actually stand in the way of it. One is selfishness. You might think, well, the selfish person, they're going to seek out as much excitement as possible. Or when they seek out relaxation, they're not going to care who um, gets involved in that. Actually, selfishness tends to stand in the way of genuine relaxation or genuine excitement. Uh, tends to produce uh, some characteristics that, that we don't want. The other thing is so what he calls uh, cultivation, mental cultivation. And what do you think he means by this? Because you've done some of this. My hope for you is that you'll, you'll continue to do this throughout your life. What is mental cultivation? Doing yeah. crosswords? Changing like your perspective on the way things are. It could be. I mean, if your perspective was more or less right from the beginning, it could just be deepening your perspective or adding things to it. But yeah, if you if you you know if you come into college, did any of you know everything before you came to college? You, you had your life completely worked out, and you, you know you didn't need to learn anything from anybody. Because if you did, then you didn't need to go to college, right? Still need the paper. 
<laughs> you need the you need the, 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 the degree. Yeah, but you don't need the merits one. You don't need to pay that much for it. Go to go to a state school. You know, um, the reason why people go to college, hopefully, is they want to have the college experience, right? And it includes a lot of different components, and not all of them are academic, right? Um, if it was, maybe you could just do stuff online, or just spend all your time at the library. You're learning, you're widening your, your range of experience. You are engaging in mental cultivation. Even doing athletics, <coughs> if you're doing it in the right way, is, is mental cultivation. I mean, you, you can ask the, the athletes, it does take some great presence of mind to be able to, to memorize plays or to figure out what good strategies are, right? Um, so let's think about this a little bit more. This is gonna lead us to some of these big ethical issues. Does everybody get to do mental cultivation? If somebody hasn't had it, do they know that they need it? I think it's not necessarily a matter of knowing that you need it rather than a natural thing that you do. Maybe you don't do it as well unless you're aware of it, but you yeah. still do it. Well, We do have something like an instinct in us to drive us to want to, to learn about things, but it's very easily diverted. Um, I mean, a lot of lives haven't had much mental cultivation. Um, a lot of them haven't had much experience either. Do you think that maybe that's something that we ought to be giving to people? If that's really what's needed for the good life, for genuine happiness, do we have a duty to make that available to people? But that was that Mill was was arguing that that it was. He was arguing at a time where he says, you know, uh, most people are not experiencing this. Most people don't even have the chance to experience this. He was writing at the height of the industrial revolution um, when a lot of people were working. Know, very, very long days for very, very low wages and living pretty short lives and there wasn't a public school system and public schools in England actually mean private schools, which is kind of a weird thing. Um, what was it like over here? It was pretty similar over here. Um, I know my, my grandparents, um, well, my grandmother went to, to high school all the girls got to go you know, to high school. My grandpa only, well, one grandpa got to sixth grade. The other one got to second grade. And then they started working. Um, do you think they got to do you know, a lot of mental cultivation? If they did, it was on the side. I, actually, both of them did because they sought it out. And then they had a lot of interesting experiences. But do we have a duty to provide this to people? Well, let me put it to you a different way. All of you went to middle school, elementary school, high school. Um, did you get out of it what you what you wanted to get out of it? Besides, you know, papers saying you can, you can get out of here. Yeah, I think, I don't know, I think we're all given the opportunity, but we're to do, to get our pleasures and, yeah, you know, and everything. I just think that a lot of people don't take advantage of the opportunity. Oh, yeah. About the experience. And I think that's just because. I, I'm, guilty of, I'm people, guilty of that myself. Not a lot of people push them in the direction like, oh, you know, you should really try getting really involved with this. You might like it. Yeah. I, I, think, I think that you're right that, um, when we offer opportunities to people, especially in this society where we, where we take so many things for granted, most people don't rise to the, to the challenge. Um, I'm, pleasant, I'm very pleasantly experienced, very uh, pleasantly surprised, excuse me, um, teaching here at Marist by how many students actually do respond to that sort of thing compared to other places that I've, I've taught. Um, but yeah, I think that you're right that a lot of people, when you offer them a chance to 
engage in mental cultivation and experience some of the higher pleasures, they, they, they don't do it. They take it for granted. They, I'm going to read the cliff notes instead of reading the book. <clears throat> I'm not going to struggle with this sort of stuff. Um, you're, you're right. But that doesn't necessarily go against whether we ought to be providing people with that. Um, that's something to think about. Mill thinks there's something like a duty to, to education, to improving society so that everybody has the chance to uh, experience these things. Um, we often take what we have very much for granted. So I think if you look at like the US generally, everybody's most people are allowed to go to, uh, through high school. Yeah. I know when I graduated, a lot of people dropped out just because for no reason other than they didn't feel like going. So I mean, yeah, it's like a line that you have to draw between, you know, keep giving them more and more opportunities or allowing them just to take advantage of the opportunities that they have in front of them. Yeah, you know where, where it really arises as an issue and I think utilitarians would be um, receptive to this. Is how much we're going to, uh, how much we're going to pay for that sort of thing. Um, it, it's interesting because some of the worst school systems in the United States are some of the ones that they throw the most money at, um, like the D.C. public schools. You know, they spend a lot of money per student, and their, their graduation rate is very low. <coughs> Chicago public schools. You know, overall the graduation rate is pretty low. Um, you can also not spend very much money and also have a very low graduation graduation rate. Like where my children live in Indiana, um, there are two schools, and the last graduation rates that I looked at for them, because there's only two high schools in the county, one was 75 percent, the other one was 66 percent, which is not very good. Um, and you know, people dropping out clearly they're not they're not doing that. And you could actually get through high school pretty easily. And not engage in much mental cultivation, just sort of show up and you know, do the right thing. And there are some schools where there's not going to be any mental cultivation taking place anyway, because you know students are packed in 30 to a room and there's no discipline and you can't get anything done. Um, I think Mill would say we ought to try to change that. Um, but you're right, cost is one of the factors that we have to look at because every time that you say taxing people, you're taking away one of the means to pleasure. Right? So that's a good segue into talking about duty and virtue and wealth. So if we know that for utilitarians, pleasure is the, the be all and end all, the final good, and we talked about all these other things before, like you know, wealth, right? If somebody desires wealth for its own end, um, we often say, well, they've, they've got their priorities screwed up, right? Somebody who's a miser, they won't, they won't spend any money, um, even though it would bring them some pleasure. Um, they won't spend it on any better things. <coughs> we would say, why do you want all that money? What's all that money for? And if we were Aristotle, we would put virtue like over here, and we'd say, well, you know, if you're virtuous, you'll get pleasure from that. But virtue is something better than pleasure. Mill will actually place virtue and duty and things like that sort of on the way. And he says, um, so here's some you know, rival conceptions of, of, of the good. Virtue is the good, or doing duty is the good. And oftentimes, they require you to go against pleasure. You know, if you want to become a, a just person every once in a while, you don't take the last piece of pie, because you already had some, and you let somebody else have it. Right? So you forego some pleasures. Um, if you want to be a temperate person, you don't eat just as much as you'd like to. You maybe eat a little bit less. Um, and you don't go out on you know, a 12-pack drinking jag every, every other night. That wouldn't be temperate, right? Although it could be pleasant, uh, pleasant for a while. Um, well, one of the things that Mill notices is that um, duty, or virtue, or wealth, or power, or any of these other goods that we've been talking about, like think about career, family, a utilitarian would say, why do we actually want these things? Well, originally we found them pleasant, or they were a means to something pleasant. And if you do this often enough, through the force of 
habits. All of these things start to get tied up together. And let's take virtue for, for an example. Um, how do people actually become virtuous? Remember back to your Aristotle. If you want to make somebody courageous, what do you have to do? Uh, they have to keep doing the, something courageous over and over again to develop the habit of Yeah, so doing. habits and involved. Then, how do you know when they've actually become courageous? Does anyone remember that from Aristotle? When they, when you say when they have the opportunity, they're challenged to a certain yeah. extent, and they either, and then they make like a, a big decision whether to be courageous or not. Yeah, they, so it involves deliberate choice. It becomes something like second nature, something you, they don't have to think about, you know, uh, before they, they actually start doing it. Um, there's another thing Aristotle says. You may have missed it. Now, I didn't actually focus on it in class. Aristotle says one way that you can tell that somebody is virtuous is they take pleasure in virtuous actions. So the courageous person, when you're first starting out um, doing things that require courage, um, it's scary, and that's a feeling, right? That's an emotion. But it's also, in a way, kind of painful. And you don't really want to do it, but you have to make yourself do it. And then, think about public speaking. How many of you, do any of you still have a fear of public speaking? Uh, I, you know, I don't have it now, but I, but I used to have it when I first started teaching. Um, I would, you know, kind of get shakes and stuff like that. Uh, and, and you do it often enough, and then after a while it goes away. How many of you had a fear of public speaking at one time? Any of you? Oh, so quite a few of you. How did it go away? You actually did some public speaking, right? Either that or, you know, you, somebody gave you a drug and then you didn't, you didn't feel scared or something like that. There's, there's ways around it, but those won't, those won't change your character, will they? Those won't change your makeup. And after a while, if you keep on doing it, you'll actually come to enjoy that sort of courageous action. And then you can transfer it to other things. So public speaking wasn't so bad, maybe cliff diving. Although, you know, that could be foolhardy too, right? Um, maybe standing up to a bully won't be so bad. Maybe standing up in a public forum for something that I believe in uh, when we're in a highly contested election uh, and people could say terrible things about me, maybe that won't be so bad. So you sort of ratchet it up, right? Maybe going in front of the boss uh, at the company that you work at and saying, I think that the company is on the wrong track. Here's why I think so. Maybe that won't be terrifying. Maybe that won't be painful. Maybe after you do it, you'll feel a sense of accomplishment. If that's the case, that becomes a habit. And then pretty soon, you become the kind of person who behaves virtuously because you actually enjoy that. If utilitarianism, if utilitarianism is going to work for individuals and for society, we actually need these sort of things to become habits. Habits that involve getting pleasure. And then we'll choose to do the right thing um, because we actually enjoy it. Um, and we won't actually think about, do I enjoy this? We'll just sort of start doing it. Again, second nature. Um, let's go on and think about some, some issues now. So one of the things that students often like to sink their teeth into are these, these big issues, right? We just talked about one, education. Do we have a duty to provide a system of education? Not, not just you know, learning you know, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, or computer skills or vocational training, or things like that, but actually teaching people what is pleasant and what is painful, and what are the higher levels of pleasure. Do we introduce them to great books? Do we introduce them to great music? Or are we going to instead cut art programs, and cut music programs, cut athletic programs as well? Um, are we going to introduce them and deepen their appreciation of these things and allow them to compare them to each other? Or are we just going to say, ah, that'll happen in college? 
which, you know, by that point, probably they're not that receptive. That's an issue. Another big issue is hunger. And with this one, we're not going to think in terms of qualitative utilitarianism. We'll think just in terms of quantitative utilitarianism. Um, right now, the world is actually, in many respects, better than it was 40 years ago. Because there's about 7 billion people in the world. Right? So, and the way it sort of splits is roughly like this. If you think about people's quality of life, so far away from food and hunger that they, they eat more than they need routinely for years and years and years. And diet a lot. You know, they get diabetes or um, heart disease or things like that. Over at the other extreme, where you have extreme poverty, I mean, th these are the people who are living on just rice. And then there's the rest of the world where <laughs> things are, you know, not so good. somewhere else. Most people um, are getting paid less, but they're they're earning more than they were before, and they're able to put more food on the table and you know um, improve their quality of life. India and China are great examples of this. There is a lot of terrible poverty in, in parts of China, but there's a lot of parts of China where things aren't so bad. So there's you know there's actually a fairly rich section as well, usually tied in with the, the party. Um, but this, this group are still vulnerable. I mean, all it takes is a couple bad harvests, and they are over here, right? Whereas a couple bad harvests, and we're not going to be really good, we'll be pretty good. Because we have a lot of things stored up, and you know, we have, I mean, look at me. You know, what is, what is fat? Fat is stored energy. Um, if I, you know, got thrown into some sort of famine situation, my body could actually use the fat reserves in my body and draw on those. I wouldn't starve to death right away. Somebody over here, they're at risk of starving all the time. So that's the situation that we're in. Now let's think about this as, as utilitarians. Uh, utilitarians have actually written a lot about this. Why, is, why are things like this? Is this just a fact of life? Is this just the way it, it has to be? We know we actually have enough food to feed everybody. America, probably, by itself, produces enough food to feed most of the world. So what would a utilitarian say? Let's think about it in terms of pain and pleasure. Being hungry, what's that like? 
Painful, yeah. Um, what happens when you're hungry besides feeling hunger pains? Can you, can you get things done? Can you concentrate? At a certain point, your like, mental abilities start to degrade. Yeah, that's why we want kids to eat. It's only in school lunch programs. We want them to eat before they come to school. And a lot of parents, you know, either uh, don't have the means or don't have the, the uh, uh, discipline to feed their kids before they come to school. So we feed them so that the kids can actually pay attention in school. And, you know, if you go to third world schools, um, some of which are actually in this area, you'll hear kids talk about, I didn't eat for two days and I'm having trouble, you know, following my lessons. And, um, you know, that's a lot of misery. And even this is, you know, could, could things be better for them? If, they, if resources were more equitably shared? Would they have more pleasure? Now, if, let's say we were to all, you know, chip in um, involuntarily. Let's say our governments all decide, okay, we're going we're to start working on these problems. We're not just going to leave it to the food companies. Um, we're going to impose a save the third world tax. On everybody. Um, that would be unpleasant, right? You, you don't make, nobody feels that they make enough money, right? And, you know, money is a means to happiness. So if they take away some of your money, they're taking away some of your happiness, right? But overall, would it be better? To have a more equitable system of food distribution. Just look at the numbers, right? If you're a utilitarian, you care about numbers. Five billion over here, one billion over here, six outweighs one, doesn't it? It Great does, but to an extent, it would be good to start off that way. Yeah. But you need to have something in place where the third, third world country can do it themselves. Otherwise, you're just ah, yeah, that's throwing yeah. resources at it, and you're not really getting you know, the other aspect of the pleasure, which is being able to reproduce, you know, being that able part to of pleasure yourself. Yeah. And being self-sufficient is a big part of yeah, being I, happy. I think you're right. Um, that could be a secondary issue to sort of address after dealing with the, uh, the first issue. Should there be a more equitable distribution? Then there would be the question, you know, if we say yes, then we'd have to ask a lot of other questions like, well, precisely how do you want to do this? And there'd be different ways to do it, some of which would pr maybe produce more pain. Um, when you make people dependent, you're right. Um, there's a certain pain that comes with being constantly dependent. Um, not everybody who benefits from, say, welfare systems looks at that as getting over um, or just their rights. Some of them find that very humiliating. You know, people have to go on food stamps, for example. Some people look at that as just, ah, that's just their right, and that's what everybody does. Other people, it kills them to do that. And that would be a type of, a type of pain. So you're right, you know, fostering independence. Maybe instead of just, you know, dealing out massive amounts of grain, we would do this, you guys are familiar with micro-lending? Any of you guys heard of that? What's micro-lending? Yeah. It's like giving out small loans to um, maybe like a, a lot of times yeah, have, like small companies that do like sewing or something in their own countries. Like, yeah, you, know, you give out these loans, and they're they're loans that for us would be like nothing. I mean, how many of us think much of dropping twenty five bucks at a restaurant? I mean, that's not a bad but for two people. That's that's a pretty cheap meal for us. But that could actually get somebody's entire livelihood going. You could buy them a couple goats. You know, you could buy them machinery because things are so cheap in the the third world. And then you're uh, giving them that, that independence and allowing them to become uh, producers over here or over here. Maybe that would produce more pleasure. Maybe doing micro-lending would be better than just doling out one gigantic check to everybody, right? Um, or giving everybody a big bag of flour. Um, but there we're talking about the means to implement it. There's the, so there's the how do you implement it, how do you actually do it, then there's the bigger issue of should we actually do that? And utilitarians would say when it comes to world hunger, those who actually have the means that we do ought to be doing things to alleviate it. And, and we actually we are to some extent, aren't we? Um, 
Um, the United States gives a lot of aid, and we're also a uh, people who do an incredible amount of volunteer and charity work. Um, charity organizations and other non-government organizations do massive amounts of aid. So that's one thing you can look at from a utilitarian perspective. Um, another issue <coughs> is punishment. And I don't mean like parents punishing child, uh, children or anything like that. But say in criminal justice, somebody commits a crime, um, should we punish them? And Mill actually talks specifically about this in uh, the, that treatise, Utilitarianism. And the utilitarians were very instrumental in changing the nature of punishment and the judicial, judicial system to uh, look at things in a bit of a different way. If you're a utilitarian, Let's think about what, what, is, what is punishment? What, what happens when you punish somebody? What, or what are some examples of punishment? Send them to jail. Okay, so prison, um, that's one big thing that we do. What else? Fine them. Yeah, uh, monetary, fines. Um, sometimes we kill them, right? It's pretty rare these days, in most states. Um, so, death. Um, sometimes sending the people to prison, depending on the circumstances, is kind of like this death sentence. Because they'll, they'll get killed by somebody inside. You know? Like when they sent uh, uh, Dahmer or Gagan into prison. Sooner or later, somebody will get to them. But that's sort of an unintended consequence. Um, any other ways we punish people? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some people find that to be very humiliating. Community service. Okay, so there could be pleasures in these, but are there usually pleasures in these? Does anybody, I mean, some people actually, you know, don't have to be sentenced and they say, I want to do some community service. That's, that's a good thing. But I don't think a lot of people get sentenced to community service, hear that, and they're like, oh, yay! Um, unless they're, they're happy they're not, say, going to prison. Um, then they're, they're, they're happier about that, right? Oh, I should have said prison or jail. Jail is different than prison. Shorter term, misdemeanor versus felony. <coughs> are there pains involved with these? Yeah, these are, these are painful things. That's why we do them. That's why we impose them take away somebody's liberty and put them in a, a place that is, is not very pleasant to be in, um, that's a pain. Um, <clears throat> we also may uh, give other people pleasure by doing that, or we may prevent them from being in pain. You know, if we take a dangerous criminal off the street, and we put him or her in, in, in prison, um, we're preventing future pain from other people, right? That they might rob or kill or rape or do whatever to. Um, community service. Maybe that's providing some other people some pleasure. Um, you know, if, if, even if it's just stuff like picking up trash, it makes things look nicer. Um, but it's unpleasant for the person experiencing it, right? Um, capital punishment, no, no treat for anybody involved. The ways in which we do it are not uh, remotely close to as painful as the way they used to be, but they're still painful, right? And um, executions are not a uh, joyous occasion for, for anybody. Um, fines. Fines, you know, you take away somebody's money, that's, that's painful, right? Or is it pleasurable? Anybody like, when you get a speeding ticket, anybody say, oh, great, 80 bucks, I couldn't wait to spend this on, on um, what county are we in here? Dutchess County. On Dutchess County. I'm so glad my, ta my not tax dollars, I'm so glad my fine dollars are going to be put to work fixing the roads. Is that how we actually behave? No, we, we see that as a, a bad thing. So these are all considered by themselves bad things, right? Because they're painful. Why do we impose them then? 
The utilitarian on the face of it would say, it's a bad thing, shouldn't do it to anybody. No. Why do we punish? Yeah. It's like to keep you from doing something worse. Exactly. Like Very worse. good. Uh, that's a good way to put it. The lesser of two evils. Um, we can set up two alternatives where, say, a dangerous criminal is allowed to be on the street. They commit more crimes. They're committing more um, bad things. They're causing other people greater pain. It, it is causing them pain to put them in prison. Actually, it may actually be inflicting pain on other prisoners, too, to have to be in a cell next to this guy. Um, but the overall balance of pleasures and pains is better. You, you're not actually picking the best thing, you're picking the lesser of two evils. Punishment always involves some, some evil, but it's the lesser of two evils. And a utilitarian would say, you can only do it for a few purposes. You can do it to actually keep people off the street, you know, because they're dangerous and you're going to prevent that, or to deter other people from committing those crimes. And now think about deterrence for a minute. Think about the other reasons why we punish people. Sometimes we punish people because we're mad at them, right? We want to see them pay. Uh, think now, not, not just about you know judicial punishment. <clears throat> think about when, when your friend treats you badly and you're not going to talk to them. Or you're going to call them a name. Or you're not going to show up for something. They, you're not going to give them a ride home or something like that. You're going to punish them. And are you, are you punishing them only because you're concerned about their future behavior? No, you're punishing them for something they did in the past, right? A utilitarian doesn't look at the past. A utilitarian looks just at the present and the future. So if the future good is not going to outweigh the badness of punishment, a utilitarian would say, don't do that. So that would rule out certain kinds of punishment, wouldn't it? A uh, utilitarian probably would not be for torturing people which they do in some places. Uh, or some, you know, some cultures do that. If you think about uh, criminal organizations, when they kill people, they often do it in very gruesome ways. Why do they do that? Well, partly to, you know, deter other people from doing it, but they inflict these horrible things on people, which I won't even talk about because uh, they may turn your stomachs. Um, but you know, you can look into the, the literature on that. So a utilitarian is going to say, <clears throat> you can have punishment, but it has to be within certain constraints. Um, there have to be certain limits on it. And it has to be done for certain purposes. <coughs> the purpose of protecting other people and deterring future bad behavior. If you're doing it just for revenge, a utilitarian would say that's not a good moment to do it. Um, lastly, let's think about, and this one's a bit more difficult one. So this is a very contentious issue. Um, how would a, a, utilit a utilitarian, somebody still strip over that word, um, how would they approach the question of, of abortion? We, and when we talk about abortion, we, we can mean a couple different things. We could mean, should abortion be legal in a society? That's often what people mean. Or we could mean something like an individual case. If a person has a pregnancy and they don't want to raise the child for one reason or another, is it, is it right or wrong for them to abort the, the, uh, the pregnancy? Um, which would you like to look at? Pick either one. Because they, they are not exactly the same issue. Should it be legal? Matter of public policy, or do you want to look at it in sort of like individual case? I think individual case. Okay, so let's think about this in terms of the individual. Um, who's, a, who's affected? We have, we're utilitarian, we look at pleasures and pains. Guaranteed, there's a mother, right? And then this is where it gets sticky. How do we label? the next person involved? Do we say child? Do we say baby? Do we say fetus? Do we say embryo? Because each one of these seems to carry some, some moral weight with it. Um, let's, let's try to take the most neutral term, we'll say fetus, right? Anybody else involved who had, would feel pleasure or pain potentially? Do you think of? Yeah. Will you go to the extended family? 
very good. Um, Anybody else who could be potentially the father? Yeah, the father. Um, often gets left out of these decisions. Sometimes, in part, because why? You know, why in many cases do women find themselves in conditions where they're <coughs> considering having an abortion uh, because the, the birth father um, vacated the premises after after they found out that, that somebody got pregnant. And there's other cases too, like rape. Right? Somebody gets gets raped and then um, there's you know a lot of trauma there with the rape and maybe the child would be a reminder of that. Um, you've all heard these arguments one way or the other, right? Um, so let's think about this in, in utilitarian terms. The father and the extended family, they're potentially affected, right? They, they could have pains and pleasures, um, but it, and it is potential, right? Maybe the father doesn't know about what's going on. Maybe the extended family never finds out because the woman who has the abortion uh, keeps it a secret. Or maybe only part of the extended family finds out, you know? The brother of the woman takes her to have the abortion. Nobody says anything about it at that point. Um, so their pains and pleasures are probably going to weigh less in the balance. So let's, let's just focus on these two then. Um, let's think about the mother. What are the potential pains involved? Yeah. Birth is, is usually pretty painful. A few women do experience it, you know, just going, you know, like, like clockwork. That's not usually the case. Um, birth is painful. Um, what else? Abortion's painful too. Oh, yeah, it was like, a medical operation. Like the like moral pain, like to actually have the abortion, and they feel uh, like guilty about it. And, uh, yeah, many many women have um, psychological problems after after having an abortion. Um, why might why might one then actually? Want to or, or, or urge having the abortion? Yeah. You don't have enough like financial support for having kids. That's or... usually the biggest one. Is, is the view is that the, the mother is going to have a lower quality of life. Um, she's going to be a single mother. Usually they're very young, you know. Um, and there usually this this pertains to the the, the child as well. The fetus comes and goes to term. They're going to be born into poverty. They're not going to be offered opportunities. Their life is not going to be very good. Um, versus ending it right away with a bit of, little bit of pain. Fetuses do feel pain. Right? We know this from seeing them writhe and stuff like that. And the fact that their nervous systems are developing. But it's over very quickly, isn't it? In general, sometimes we've watched abortions. But, um, Utilitarians would most likely be for abortion if the mother wants to do it. Because <clears throat> a lot of the psychological pain comes about thinking that it's wrong, and that's precisely what's being determined <clears throat> at this point. Kant would say something completely different. We're going to look at Kant uh, next. Um, the other thing to think about, I'm going to put this into the problem. There are some women who have abortions and then go on to have kids, and they say things along the lines of, well, if I, if I didn't abort the first kid, or abort the, birth, abort the first fetus, then my later children wouldn't have it as good as they do. A utilitarian would actually be receptive to that argument, because they look at everything in terms of an aggregate of individual pains and pleasures. And a utilitarian probably would be receptive to the idea of a life whose quality is so low that it, that it, would, it would be worse than, than not living. Um, Kant, again, is not going to see things this way. Thomas Aquinas wouldn't see things this way. But that is where utilitarianism would go on, on this. So I'll see all of you uh, Thursday.